All right, so um, let's start lecture B by looking at this example. Again, this came up on the uh, completion assignment. If I put a non-true-false, non-multiple-choice question related to chapter 18 on the exam, I think most likely it might be some type related to some example like this. Because this is where I would, this is where I was having fun for one thing, and uh, I hope you kind of were interested by it as well. Um, but use the the idea of the norm here to help us as a tool. So the norm in in this ring z with the root square root of negative five adjoined is a plus b times square root of negative five is you can write it without without absolute value signs as a squared plus five b squared minus negative five b squared would be plus five b squared and you can get rid of the absolute value signs when d is negative and um, the, so the goal here in this example is to essentially show it's an integral domain that's not a unique factorization domain. We already know it's an integral domain. We've already told that at least. Show it's not a UFD. Show, for example, e.g., essentially means for example, 21 does not factor uniquely as a product of irreducibles. That's one example. So certainly 21 factors is 3 times 7. And so part of what you might want to do is to do this, part of what you would need to do is verify that 3 and 7 are irreducible. And you might be saying to yourself, well, I already know they're prime. Well, yeah, you know they're prime in Z, and therefore also irreducible in Z, but that does not necessarily mean they are irreducible in this ring. That takes, that takes proof. Okay. Um, but then you also want to find some other factorization of 21. And thinking about complex number arithmetic, it's, and also thinking about the, the nature of this particular ring, it's helpful to imagine or hope that you could multiply complex numbers of the, these, this form right here to get 21. A complex number of this complex conjugate. Just a little brief idea of what's going, what I mean there as far as knowledge about complex arithmetic is um, if you multiply a complex number times its complex conjugate, Uh, which geometrically in this complex plane, these, these numbers are reflections of each other across the horizontal real axis. This would be a plus b square root of negative 5, and this would be a minus b square root of negative 5. And when you multiply a complex number times its complex conjugate, you get a real number. And essentially the reason for that is because uh, these two angles for these complex numbers have to add together for the angle of the product. But because of the symmetry, they are opposites of each other. You know, I don't know, just pretend this is 30 degrees here, this would be negative 30 degrees. And they would have to add to zero degrees. And also, the, the distance to the origin for each of these gets multiplied for the product. The product being 21 um, has a distance to the origin of 21, so the, the length of these line segments should actually be square root of 21. I want this to be true. And so then the question is, are there in integers a and b that make this true? And if you actually do some solving here now, expand this out, ah. hey, that looks familiar. It's the same as the norm when you multiply that out. Equals 21, you're looking for integer solutions to that. And lo and behold, there are some. You can take a to be 1 and b to be 2. 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, times 5 is 20, 1 plus 20 is 21. So 21 does factor then as 1 plus 2 root negative 5 times 1 minus 2 root negative 5. And so then if you could also show those numbers are irreducible in this ring, you'd be done. This would be enough to verify that this is unique, not a unique factorization of me. So then the question is, how do you now verify that all these things are irreducible? And it's the norm function that does it for you. Um, although this is coming out different than I remembered it. Thank you. 
what I'm thinking about right now is not mentioned by key. Yeah, okay, I, I, I was just confusing myself. I need to focus, for example, on, say, 3 and 7. I was, I was focusing on the 21. That I was thinking about the norm of 21 being a huge number and not remembering huge numbers coming up my key. But I, I can focus on, for example, say I focus on 3. Okay, what's the norm of 3? Use the formula. 3 is 3 plus 0 times the square root of negative 5. The norm would be 3 squared, 9. What's my goal? My goal is to show 3 is irreducible. So suppose 3 is written as a product x times y. And the goal would be to show x, either x or y as a unit. Well, replace 3 with x times y inside the norm function. And then use property b of norms. And this is the same as the norm of x times the norm of y. And so what we have here is that 9 equals the norm of x times the norm of y, so there are a limited number of possibilities for these integers. These are integers, positive integers here. They could be plus or minus, they could be threes, they could be both threes. One could be 9, one could be 1. If one of them was 1, though, then we have another property of norms that said, for example, if n of x was 1, that x would then be a unit. That was another property of norms. So what you could do is do a little argument by contradiction. Assume to the contrary that neither x nor y are units. That would mean both of these numbers would have to be 3. If x and y are not units, that implies n of x and n of y both have to equal 3. These have to be non-negative integers, <coughs> and their product is 9. If they're not units so that these things are not 1, they both have to be 3. But that's essentially a contradiction because you'd be saying you'd have integer solutions to this kind of equation. And there are three of them. Not really proving that, but it's pretty obvious, I hope. And I would take it as being obvious enough that you would not have to prove that on the exam. And you could give a brief argument. You could say, well, obviously, if b is 0, a squared would have to be 3, but a if square root of 3 is not an integer, if a were 0, then b squared would have to be 3 fifths. Uh, it, you can definitely argue that you can't do it. If neither of them is 0, for example, if a is 1, then it, it, it won't work. You can give a pretty quick argument that there are no integer solutions of this. But it's hopefully also pretty obvious and we can take it as something you can just say. If you used uh, 7 instead of 3, you'd have a 49 there instead of a 9. If these are not units, they both have to be 7. If this equals 7, there's also no solutions. Maybe that's a little harder to be a positive of. <coughs> but it is true. If b were 1, for example, then a squared would have to be 2. That's not possible. What about these things? Showing each of these is irreducible plug those things into the norm function as well. Uh, what will you get when you plug this into the norm function? You get 1 squared, which is 1, plus 5 times 2 squared. You get 21. There would be a 21 there instead. One of these would have to be 3, and one would have to be 7 if neither is a unit, and that would be contradictions as well, because you have the same kind of contradiction. So if that went too fast for you, it is in the answer key for chapter 18. Look at it again. Um, probably on the exam, I would not have to prove all four of these are irreducible, but maybe one of them, and I'd say just trust that the others are. And that would mean that this is an example of a, an integral domain that is not a unique factorization domain.
All right, let's review the other chapters now. <clears throat> Again, I'm saying chapter 10 is worth reviewing. Probably not because I'm going to give you questions that are just related to group homomorphisms, but as a w way of helping you do problems that involve ring homomorphisms. Like kind of the main example we focused, focused on, ring homomorphisms from the Zn to Zm. We had a homework problem that said they essentially have to be of this form based on A being the image of 1. And if you're mapping from Zn to Zm, um, the fact that A is an element of Zm means by Lagrange's theorem, which you should still be able to quote, that the order of A does have to divide M. But also, there's a property of ring home of group homomorphisms, actually, in chapter 10, that would say the order of this element in the image must divide the order of the input for that element to get that output. So the order of A has to divide the order of 1, but this one is in Zn. It's a generator for Zn. Its additive order is n. So A here, here has to divide both m and n as you've had on quizzes. And moreover, because it's a ring homomorphism, it's also the fact that A squared has to equal A has come up on the quizzes as well, and you should be able to verify that. So that does limit the possibilities for what A can be. A conceivable problem would be to Maybe I wouldn't have you prove these things, but maybe I'd have to use them in one more homework problem. Finding the possible ring homomorphisms from, I think it was Z20 to Z30. Yeah. Homework problem like that. That's what comes to my mind in terms of trying to combine all these ideas. Uh, to find possible ring homomorphisms. We had other examples of ring homomorphisms, perhaps the most important of which was mapping a mapping that does something like this. It takes an arbitrary polynomial and maps it to its output at a particular value of a, and we'll often use a as zero. And that also maps it to the constant term. That was one of the two most important examples. The other kind of important example was the um, essentially the mod p. Well, it didn't have to be mod by p, but essentially, as far as applying these ideas in chapter 17, we have the mod p irreducibility test, where we took our polynomial and modded the coefficients by a prime p. Right, so we can use that test. And that essentially was a homomorphism, a ring homomorphism. That was our second most important example. Um, chapter 11 was groups that we did do since the last exam. Uh, this was the uh, fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups. Given a prime factorization of an integer n, determine the number of abelian groups of order n. To determine that number, you can just use the idea of the number of partitions of the exponents of the primes. And you, then after you find the number of those partitions, you multiply the answers to get the final answer you quiz on that. And also write down the isomorphism classes in examples where you don't have too many possibilities. Um, if, for example, the group had an order Two to the six times three to the fifth. I could ask you how many possible abelian groups are of, are there of that order. You have to write down how many partitions there are. Six. You have to figure it out. And 
probably the best way to figure out the number of partitions of six would be to write them down. There's six itself, there's five plus one, there's four plus two, there's four plus one plus one. I'm trying to be somewhat systematic about this. There's three plus three, three plus two plus one, three plus one plus one plus one. It's a lot of these. And you hope you don't forget any. I don't forget. There's two plus four, but we've already done that one. Three plus two plus four, we've done that one. We've already done two plus one plus three as well. We've not done two plus two plus two. Two plus two plus one plus one. Two plus one plus one plus one plus one. And one plus one plus one plus one plus one plus one. Have I missed any? I think I got them all. How many partitions are there of six? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven of them. Yeah, that sounds right. How many partitions are there of five? Fewer of them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So all together you have 11 times 7. You have 77 possible isomorphism classes for abelian groups of this order. How about the number of partitions of the exponents? And then multiply those numbers. Of course, I would not have you write them all down. That example, but maybe an easier example. One example of um, a possible isomorphism class would be, say, combining um, maybe this, these possibilities for partitions of the exponents with this one. What do I mean? I mean having a cyclic group of order 2 to the 4th as one of the factors in the external direct product, a cyclic group of order 2 squared. I'm looking at the 4 and the 2 as being the exponents of the 2 is here. And now I'm going to look at the 3 and the 2 as being exponents of the 3. 3 cubed and 3 squared. And of course, if you were asked to do so, you could simplify this. And you should also remember <coughs> that you can write this in other ways. You can combine the cyclic groups that have um, orders that are relatively prime. <coughs> For example, one thing you could do is you could combine the 16 and the, set and the 27 to give you z sub 16 times 27, whatever that is, and combine the 4 and the 9 to give you z 36, and that would be isomorphic to this one. That's one example of something. Chapters 12 and 13, fundamental definitions, what's a ring, what's a commutative ring, what's a ring with unity, what are subrings, what's a zero divisor, what's an integral domain, what are units, what are, what's, what are fields. You should be able to define all those things on the exam, and maybe it's just a pure definition problem, not a true false or local choice. That does include the very first one, ring. Now you could list out the properties. You could essentially just mimic what, you, what the book does in chapter 12, at the definition of the ring on page 227. You could also do what I did, which was say, a ring is a set on which there are defined two binary operations, addition and multiplication which effectively means when I say binary operation, it means it's closed under those operations. That's an abelian group under addition, and for which under multiplication you have um, the associative property, 
and the right and left distributive properties with respect to multiplication over addition. Say that again. It's a set with two binary operations that implicitly implies closure. If you want to say that, you can, but you don't have to. It's an abelian group under addition. As far as multiplication goes, it's got the associative property and right and left distributive properties. Multiplication over addition. Not in general assuming it's commutative with respect to multiplication. If it is, then you say it's commutative ring. Not, not necessarily assuming it's got a unity, a one. If it does have one, you say it's got unity. Subrings are subsets that are rings in their own right under the same operations. Zero divisors are, of course, um, things that are non-zero that can yet multiply together to give you zero. And the main examples to think of about there are Zn, where n is not prime. You will find examples of zero divisors when n is not prime. <laughs> Integral domains are commutative rings with unities that don't have zero divisors. And the cancellation property holds. Units are things with uh, non-zero elements with multiplicative inverses, and zero is never a unit, by the way. And fields, you can say, are commutative rings with unity in which every non-zero element has, is a unit, has multiplicative inverse. And then there are exa your basic examples and properties, Z, NZ, so do all multiples of N, ZX, matrix rings, Gaussian integers, those are the main examples that were introduced. ZN, whether N is prime or not. When N is prime, then it becomes a, a field. Finite integral domains are always fields, that's another property. Infinite integral domains like Z that are not fields. And then there's that idea of a characteristic. I'll bring in more examples that were given in the book. Characteristic being the smallest positive integer and making this true for all x in the ring, where this, this means. This really means x added to itself n times um, n is assumed to be a positive integer here. If there is such an n, then we say that's the characteristic of the ring. If there is no such n, then you say the characteristic is 0. Then we got into ideals and factor rings and ring homomorphisms, definitions. What's an ideal? What's a factor ring? What's a prime ideal? What's a maximal ideal? Um, so ideals are the superclosed things, superabsorbent. They're kind of like a paper towel on a table sucking up the spill. With respect to multiplication, at least. And here's your ideal. Here's an element of the ideal. Give me an arbitrary element in the ideal or not. Let's draw it so it's not. R times A and A times R are both in the ideal. Superclosure. Right? It's like the product, the product. Even when R is outside the ideal, it gets sucked into the, the ideal itself. Not just closure and superclosure. Right? You get what I mean when I say that? The things that are outside A. Under multiplication, not, not addition necessarily. Under multiplication. It's necessary to have that definition in order, in order to define factor rings so that the um, 
the multiplication of the factor ring is well defined is the key thing. It's not something you should study as well. Maximal and prime ideals, first of all, are not, oh, excuse me, they're, they're not the whole ring. They are proper, first of all. The whole ring is not a maximal or prime ideal in itself because it's not proper. To make these worthwhile concepts, you need to think about proper ideals. Uh, prime ideals are the ones where if the product is in the ideal, that implies one or the other of the elements is in the ideal. And maximal means if you've got um, some other ideal B that's sort of set inclusion-wise in between A and R, in fact, B would have to either equal A or R. B equals A or B equals R with maximal ideals. It's assumed here A is not equal to R. It's a proper idea. And then uh, the theorems that when A was prime, R mod A, this factor ring, this quotient ring, was an integral domain when A was prime. And when A is maximal, it's a field. And the second one especially is pretty important for us. It's a way of constructing fields with those polynomial rings. Calculations in factor rings and theorems. I just mentioned the theorems. Um, so there are plenty of those examples in both in the book and in your completion assignment, and we done, did some in class where we did calculations in this factor ring. Those were the things that I said were the most important calculations, and those are going to, I probably can't resist putting one of those in the exam. It's so important. And I think if you look at those old exams, I think there's at least one question on those old exams where I have to do calculations in factor rings like this. Um, not just for now, but for after the test. Starting next week, we're going to come back to this and continue doing more, more calculations with factor rings like this. And we finish our last couple of class doing chapters 19, 20, 21, and 22. We already talked about ring homomorphisms. Final slide here is on chapter 16 and 17. Polynomial rings and factorization. Of course, adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing polynomials I mean here. Division algorithm coming into play, using a long division, synthetic division. The definitions of irreducibility and reducibility over an integral domain. ID means integral domain. A and over a field, in which is a simpler definition. And then your fundamental facts. Uh, first of all, if D is an integral domain, then the polynomial ring is also an integral domain. Then there's the remainder theorem, the factor theorem, the number of zeros theorem. You can't have more than n zeros over a field if the degree of the polynomial is n. F being a field meaning, meaning this is a PID, this criterion. And then there's the, all the irreducibility, re reducibility theorems. So that would include the degree two or three irreducibility test over a field, um, which is if and only if, if it's the degree two or three, but it still was one direction, even when the degree was larger than three. Uh, there was the, there's Eisenstein's criterion, there's, there's the mod P irreducibility test is probably the most important one. I, I think I'm going to, I'm leaning toward giving you one problem where you need the mod P reducibility test. And um, there was also the um, rational root theorem that was that exercise. If I do give you one on that, um, I'll state what the theorem is so you don't have to, you don't have to memorize it. Um, and I'd make it an easier problem where you would not need technology to figure out the rational just using a limited number of possibilities for the rational roots and just using the synthetic division would be enough to solve it. Should we be able to state definitions from chapter 10 and 11? No. But from later chapter, yes.
Any other questions? All right, see you Wednesday.